Amen. I just absolutely love that song. And I happen to love, part of the reason I partly love it is because one of the people that we tend to pass over very, very quickly as we, just th we talk about the Christmas story is the person of Mary. Um, Joseph's probably ignored even more than she is, but Mary, at least for a lot of us, is a minor character in the Christmas story. We talk a little bit about her faith, and we talk a little bit about how she trusted God. But for the most part, we've always focused on who, on on the birth itself and upon the wise men. They seem to be the two popular characters. But Mary is an important person to talk about in the scripture because she has a unique view of Jesus. We have started a new series. We started this Saturday, which I have laughingly called, Will the Real Jesus Please Stand Up? And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about how we view Jesus Christ in light of what happened 2,000 years ago on the day when we celebrate his birth. Now, I realize, to be honest, that he wasn't born in December. I recognize that we have made it a tradition, and it's not necessarily historically accurate to say that Jesus was born on December 25th. We don't know exactly what day he was born. Um, he was born to a carpenter and his wife in a little town called Bethlehem and the city of Judea and then you know the country of Judea. He was an obscure birth and there wasn't like tons and tons of people who wrote it down. They didn't keep birth certificates at that point. So it was basically word of mouth. So I'm sure Mary and Joseph knew what day Jesus was born. But historically, we really don't know. Um, as a child, he would have probably been considered fairly unremarkable, except for a couple of things that happened at the first couple of years of his birth. And we, you know, a lot of the stuff we focus on in the Christmas story isn't really stuff that happened at the time of his birth. For instance, the three wise men. The three wise men probably didn't show up until Jesus was almost two years old. Um, we know that for the fact because Herod had every baby executed who was under the age of two um, based on what he had learned from the wise men trying to wipe out what he thought to be the king. Um, so they weren't still in the manger when the wise men showed up. And I, I know that there's a lot of um, a lot of Christmas tradition that shows the wise men at the um, stable, but the, historically and biblically, Jesus was a he was not listed as an int as a baby any longer. If you go read what the New Testament actually says when the wise men showed up, he was a child. He was not no longer a newborn. And you just you have to understand a little bit of how they talk about things, how to understand how that lays out. But Mary has a unique view of Jesus Christ, a unique view that I think helps us to understand who Jesus is and how we can apply that to our life. Now, I want to remind you that Saturday we talked about how the prophets saw Jesus, how the book of Isaiah portrays our Savior and who Jesus Christ really is. And you'll remember some things that that prophecy in Isaiah talked about him coming, how he would be wonderful counselor, everlasting God, prince of peace. That is how they picture him, a coming king. Admittedly, they also picture him as a suffering servant. And so you understand that their picture of Jesus Christ gives us an idea of how we need to see him and how we need to relate to him. Our text tonight comes from uh, the book of Luke and chapter 1. And, and I'm actually reading from a, uh, a version of the Bible called the Bible in Basic English. Um, and this is verses 26 through 35. And now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin who was to be married to a man named Joseph of the family of David. And the name of the virgin was Mary. And the angel came into her and said, Peace be with you, to whom special grace has been given. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at his words and said to herself, What may be the purpose of these words? And the angel said to her, Have no fear, Mary, for you have God's approval. And see, you will give birth to a son, and his name will be Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be named the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the kingdom of David, his father. He will have rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, because I have had no knowledge of a man? 
And the angel in answer said to her, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will come to rest on you. And so that which will come to birth will be named Holy, Son of God. Today, as we continue our series of sermons that help us see Jesus Christ and help us get a better picture of who he is and what he is really about, we are looking at Mary. You know, third day, Stephen Curtis Chapman and Mercy Me wrote the following in a song entitled, I See Love. Some see a teacher standing on a hill speaking words of wisdom. Some see a healer reaching out his hand to give sight to the blind. Some see a dreamer wasting his life on what can never be. Some see a fool dying for his dreams. But I see love, I see love, light of heaven breaking through. Well, I see grace, I see God's face shining pure and perfect love. As we look at these verses from Luke, I want us to see what Mary saw when she looked at Jesus. So come as me, come with me as we look at Jesus through Mary's eyes. First thing that Mary saw, Mary saw Jesus as a king to serve. Look at what it says in 33, 31, 33, in verse 31. And see, you will give birth to a son, and his name will be Jesus. He will be great, and he will be named the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the kingdom of David, his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Name him Jesus means his name was God saves. It's the same word we hear from Hebrew when they talked about Joshua. It's basically the same name. Yeshua is the Hebrew word. And we will talk more about his name as Jesus, as Savior, when we talk about Joseph. But I wanted, to, I wanted you to see the names that the angel told Mary he would be. And she told her that he will be great. You know, sometimes we wonder if our leaders are going to be great or whether they're going to be good or not. And toward the end of the term, people began to talk about legacy billing as if what they will be remembered before. But the answer is really given here. Jesus was going to be a great king. He was going to be the greatest king to ever live. Jesus would be great in his love, great in his compassion, great in his sacrifice. He would live a great life, teach great parables, and give great sermons. He would heal with great power and be a great example he would die a great death and would be resurrected in great power. And he would give the great commission and ascend to a great height. And he will come again in great glory. And he longs to get great changes in your life and in mine if we but let him. He's also the son of the Most High. It is a clear reference to God. He's basically telling her, Mary, this is going to be God's son. This is going to be God in person, God incarnate. Remember what the angel said to the shepherds? Glory to God in the highest. He will sit on the throne of his father David. Now what I find always interesting about this is he is God. So he created man. I mean, the book of John says that Jesus was the agent of creation. That all things were made by him and through him. So he created David, put David on the throne, and then he was going to inherit that throne from David. It's a reference to him being Messiah. He's the promised one. He's the coming one. He's the anointed one. He came, he came out of the lineage of David that was promised in 2 Samuel 7, 12-16. And it said in verse 33 that his kingdom will not end. That Jesus' reign is king. It's forever and ever. It never ended. It never does. It never will. He will reign for eternity. Sometimes we see an end of one leader and the beginning of the next, and we are saddened that it is over. Sometimes we see a leader go, and we're glad he's gone. But we can see the next is going to be worse than thus. Our lives are going to be more difficult, or sometimes they're going to be better. But Jesus reigns forever. He never steps down from office. He lives for eternity. He will never end. But he is not just a king who rules in heaven. He is a king of our lives. You see, one of the things that we tend to forget is that Jesus is king. He is king of you. He is king of me. He is king of my life. He is my Lord. He is my boss. He is my master. I serve a living God. I serve Jesus Christ. He not only saved me, but saved me. It's not only just saved me from my sins, but saved me for him to be free from my sins 
and be free to serve him. See, we need to learn to think of Jesus Christ as our king. He is the king. Kings are worthy to be worshipped, worthy to be crowned, worthy to be followed. True kings, as Jesus is, love their subjects, and he sacrificed for his subjects. He sacrificed for his people. He adopted us into his family because our king died for us. Mary also saw a son that she could nurture. I think it's a good reminder that Jesus came at just the right time. You know, he was born at a time when God was ready for it. God had done all the prep work. God had it in a right place at the right time at the right moment. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Jesus came at a time when Rome was at its zenith, and the spread of the gospel would go quickly around the known world on roads built by Rome. The Roman Empire built roads, and so the gospel could spread a lot more quickly because it came at that time. God's timing was impeccable, and he's always just at the right time. Jesus was born when God had it all planned out. God had it all worked out. Jesus was born. He wasn't hatched or found in a cabbage patch. He didn't just appear in thin air. He suddenly didn't just drop in. He was completely human, and he was completely God. He was the Son of the Most High. Not only that, but it promises in the Old Testament that he would be wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. It's in the Old Testament. It's a, it is a prophecy, and it's one of 300 prophecies in the New Old Testament alone about Jesus and who he was and how he would be born and how he would live his life. There is so much in the Old Testament that predicts Jesus Christ, that points to the coming Savior, and somehow people chose to ignore it. They knew it back then. It wasn't a surprise, but they had interpreted it differently. And so they believed the suffering servant was Israel. They believed that Israel was the one who was going to save man from its sins, that Israel was going to be the one to redeem the world, not Jesus Christ, not a Messiah in person. They had taken those prophecies and turned them in on themselves. But you know what? He came back, he was a nurturing, small infant. God of heaven took on a human form. He didn't come as a strong warrior. He didn't come as a fighting man. You know what he came back? He came at first as a baby. He was vulnerable as a child. That's one of the reasons Herod, who inspired by Satan, I'm sure, tried to murder him you know, while he was still a baby, while he was still a toddler. He is helpless and could be struck down if not for the intervention of God and the parents that God had put over him. Jesus Christ made himself vulnerable to take on that human form. He didn't have to do that. He could have shown up in glory. Your computer is there? I don't know what to tell you, virtual. This should remind us that Jesus knows how to take care of you because he had someone take care of him. He knows what it means to care for someone. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces when he, is, he was despised. You know, the Bible said, the Bible says that Jesus, when he died, was not recognizable as a human being any longer. He had been so beaten and battered that he was hardly recognizable as human. There was nothing that drew people to him. There was nothing to look at that thing hanging on the cross and think that's even human, much less the Son of God. Surely he took on our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God and stricken by him and afflicted. Isaiah 53, 3 and 5, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. But he was pierced. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Secondly, there was no room at the inn. The world didn't care, but Mary did, and Jesus does. Let your heart prepare room for him, casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. 
1 Peter 5, 7. If the world persecute you, the devil terrify and make your heart sad by his fiery darts. If brethren are, are malicious and treacherous to you or in any other way attack you, be not angry and impatient, murmur and complain not, even if they continue a long time and there's no end to it. The time will not be so long, for God takes it to heart, and he will attend to all. Indeed, by becoming angry and impatient, we only give them occasion to tread us entirely under their feet. Because uh, us... I'm sorry. Give them occasion to tread us entirely under their feet, because this cause us all suffering and damage, and finally also ruin us. Therefore, do not worry in the least, only take care of this. And do not be over-anxious as to how I shall secure money, home, food, and the like. How shall I be delivered from the need, of da need or danger? Where will I be when I die? But follow my counsel. Let everyone do as his calling what God commands him. Does evil befall him while doing his duty? Then he endures it and proves thereby his patience and humility and consoles himself besides that God, to whom he is now reconciled through Christ, on whom's child he has become through faith in him, is almighty and merciful. On him he calls and casts all his anxiety and confidence upon him, whether temporal or spiritual, for he careth for us, that we should in no way doubt. Don't you get it? God desires to take care of us. He has provided a way. Part of what Jesus did by coming to earth was to make a path, to be the first. Jesus cares for you, so will you let him? Will you go to him and cast all your cares on him? That means your worries, that means your concerns. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8-9 Wrapped in his swaddling clothes and his manger laid, the hope and glory of all lands came to our world's aid. Jesus Christ came to earth in human form in a vulnerable little baby and was born in a manger in poverty. It didn't even have a bed to lay him down in. He was in a feeding trough in a stable. You know, we use the word manger and that sounds so much better, but you know what it really was? It was the trough they used to feed the animals with. That's where they put the hay for the animals to eat out of. That's what a manger is. It's not this beautiful, clean, it's dirty, filthy straw with donkeys and camels. And camels are filthy creatures. And so you can just imagine what that manger must have been like. And we're not talking about, I mean, we have a lovely manger scene out here beside us. But if, if, it's, if it was really to look like it would have back then... Okay, a manger was a stable was normally not a building that sat out beside. It was usually a cave in the side of a hill near a house. Most mangers in that area were just caves, dirty, dank, filled with straw and animals and noises. And I'm sure it wasn't a joyful, pleasant experience. It wasn't a beautiful place to be. The ends weren't much better. But the stables were worse. The third thing that Mary saw when she looked at Jesus. Yeah, we don't have any hills to build kind of stables around here, Brian. I realize that. But I want you to see what Jesus was really born in. We've cleaned it up. We kind of sanitized it when we do our Christmas celebrations. But the reality is that Jesus was born in a very filthy place. He was born in abject poverty. Joseph was a carpenter. Mary was about 15 or 16 years old when Jesus was born, folks. She was a child. It was normal for women to be betrothed at that age. And then the, the husband was usually several years older. And what he did was he would go out. And once he got the house built, that's when the marriage would take place. But he had to have a house built to take her home to first. And sure, I'm sure that's what Joseph was doing when Mary came to him and told him she was with child. So they were getting ready to be officially married. But they, there's, a, there's a point in that point, part of the betrothal process and that culture in that time was they were married 
and they didn't go with anybody else or see anybody else. They were considered to be married, but they didn't stay in the same house, and they didn't come together as man and wife. So they were betrothed. That's why she was called a virgin. So what do you think about Christmas? What do you think we see when we see Christmas? When we see Jesus, do we focus on the stress? Do we focus on the increased activity? Are we worried about what we're going to buy our friends for Christmas or what we're going to get for Christmas? You know, I, I found kind of what the world sees when it sees Jesus. And I found this interesting little poem about what the world sees when it starts talking about Christmas. Listen to this. "'Twas the night before Christmas and Santa's a wreck. How to live in a world that's politically correct. His workers no longer want to be called elves. Vertically challenged, they're calling themselves." Four reindeer had vanished without much propriety, released to the wilds by the Humane Society. The runners had been removed from his sleigh. The ruts were termed dangerous by the EPA. And to show you the strangeness of life's ebbs and flows, Rudolph was suing over the misuse of his nose. And he had gone on to Geraldo in front of the nation, demanding millions in overdue back compensation. Is that what we see when we see Jesus? Jesus' birth is all about Christmas, a time when we get how much we can accumulate. Christmas is not about Santa Claus. It never has been about Santa Claus. Poor old Nicholas, the man whom the legend of Santa Claus grew out of, would be spinning in his graves if he really knew how we had miswarped his, his story. You know, there really was a Nicholas. He really did exist. He lived in a place called Asia Minor, which we now call Turkey. Old Nicholas get, was, a, was born into a wealthy family. His parents wanted him to be a lawyer. They sent him off to the finest school so he could be in the government. And they wanted him to be a lawyer. And the truth was that he didn't. He got saved. He became a believer, which was not a popular thing to do. Because it was at a time frame where being a Christian wasn't necessarily safe. It wasn't right at the point where there was a great deal of persecution going on, but being a believer usually meant that you were kind of relegated to the slums of the city. You weren't really allowed to be in the halls of power. But here's this rich guy who gets saved, and what's he do? He starts giving away his money. He's got all this money from his parents, and he's you know he just wants to give it away. He wants to help people with it. And in those days, there was a, a practice that when a family got into real trouble, they would sell off their kids into slavery to help pay the bills. And there was a man with three daughters, and he couldn't get them married because he had to come up with a dowry for somebody to marry his daughters. That was part of the tradition. And so he was thinking about selling his youngest daughter off so his oldest daughter could get married, so he could raise the money to have a decent dowry for his daughter to get married. And Nicholas heard about this, and he collected, he got a bag of gold, gold, you know, that's money there. And he snuck into the guy's house at night and left the bag of gold at the, at the, on the table in the doorway so that the guy wouldn't have to sell his child off into slavery. He was doing, he didn't want any recognition for it, he didn't want anybody to know he did it. And in fact, for the longest time, the old man, he, he was scratched his head trying to figure it out. And he thought and he asked and nobody knew. Nobody had seen a thing. Finally, he let it be known that, that um, they had his daughter had gotten married. And so he was the second daughter to get married. And he was going to have to sell the other daughter because he would used all the gold for the dowry. And not that he really did, but he told the story because he was trying to get the guy to help him again because he was going to try to find out who it was. And so he sat up that night and waited for whoever it was to sneak into the house. Well, Nicholas saw the light in the house, realized the guy was still up, and waited and waited and waited, could get in. So what he did was he actually climbed down the fire hole in the house. And we're not talking about a traditional chimney. We're talking about about 150 to 350 AD, which the house wasn't like we think of as a house and a chimney. It was basically a hole in the roof where they let the smoke go out. But he uh, he climbed down through the smoke hole while the guy was had dozed off and was process of putting the gold down, and the guy woke up just as he saw Nicholas jump back out, out through the hole. And that's kind of where we get the story of Santa Claus coming down the chimney. I mean, it's gotten warped and changed, but it wasn't about giving gifts. He was showing Christian love. He was trying to help a family. 
And of course, the guy realized who it was, and he started telling everybody, and it became famous. Wasn't what he intended, and it really wouldn't be happy to know that he's thought of as a big, fat, Raleigh jolly red guy, guy wearing a red suit and running around with reindeer. There weren't no reindeer in Turkey, and there weren't no reindeer in Ainge Minor. We've, we've taken Christmas, and we've messed it up. See, the real Christmas treasure, the real present of Christmas, was Jesus Christ. He was the treasure that Mary saw. Mary saw him as a true treasure to be pre to be to be precious, to be something you you cling to and hold to and and cherish. She held on to those memories and reflected on them. She thought about everything that happened. She thought about the angel, she thought about the and and the, when he was almost 2 and the wise men showed up and gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh. Really perfect timing on God's part because they used that to flee to Egypt. And that's what they lived on for two years in Egypt was the gold, frankincense, and myrrh that the wise men had brought them. See, you always wonder why God had the wise men come. Well, there was plan to all that. He was getting Jesus because there was another prophecy that said, out of, out of Egypt I have called my son. That's one of the prophecies about the Messiah. And so Jesus had to go to Egypt to fulfill a prophecy and then come back. Um, she pondered those things. She realized that he was a treasure. He was precious. And not just because of her son, but because of the promise that God had given her about who he was and who he will be. She weighed them to her heart. She considered each of these thoughts and kept that which was most important. Colossians 2, 2 and 3 says, So that their hearts may be comforted, and their being joined together in love, that they may come to the full wealth of the certain knowledge of the secret of God, Christ, in whom are all the secret stores of wisdom and knowledge. Mary really does illustrate how we are supposed to see God, how we are supposed to view Jesus Christ. He is our King. He is a precious treasure. He is our Savior. He is our master. We forget that sometimes, that he is the one who saved us from our sins. That he is a son to nurture. He was God's son. He was worthy of our praise. He is still worthy of our praise. Mary saw the real Jesus. Mary illustrates exactly to us what a hungry heart wants to understand the depth of great salvation. What is Jesus to you then? Are you to look at him? Do you see something different than the world around you? He was king. He was precious, and he was her guard. He was her burden bearer. Mary, his mother, had to be saved as well. Mary had to be saved, just like the rest of us. Her being God's giving birth to Jesus did not give her a complete trip to heaven. She is not God. She does not have godlike powers. She cannot forgive sin. She does not be the mother of heaven, as some call her. She is a human being who is a sinner and had to be saved, just like the rest of us. Jesus died on that cross for his mother, just like he died on the cross for us. We need to learn to see Jesus as Mary saw him. She saw him as her king. She gave birth to her king. Think about that. This was her son, and yet she was the one standing at the foot of the cross, when he died, she watched his die death, and he was ro he rose again. He was the one who cared. He knew that he cared for her, and still cares for her, just like we need to learn to see him as our burden bearer. Is there something you're tugging around that's way too heavy, and you just are so frustrated and worried and concerned about it, you can't let it go? You cast your cares on him. He cares for you. He loves you. He spent his life to redeem you and to free you from your sin. He can free you from your worry. He can free you from your pain. Will he make everything perfect and right? No, he will not. You live in a troubled world, and we all struggle and change and develop. That's part of life. He doesn't save us and whisk us to heaven the minute we're saved. It doesn't work that way. He leaves us here to grow and to develop. But he can take away the worry. He can take away the pain because you can put it all on his shoulders and learn to trust him. The problem is learning to trust him. 
once you get it in your head that he's the one you have to put all your cares upon to rest on him and to allow him to carry you see we don't want to do that we think we got to do it ourselves we work our little tail ends off so that we can provide for ourselves we want to be in control and that's part of the problem you need to also learn to see Jesus as your precious treasure he really does some he really is merciful and gracious and wonderful he really is the wonderful counselor mighty god prince of peace he is your savior he loves you so much he died on a cross for you 2000 years ago the jesus that we need to see at christmas is the same Jesus Mary saw. It's the same Jesus the prophet saw. Next year, next week, we're going to talk about the the Jesus that was our Savior that that Joseph saw when he when Jesus was born. We're going to talk about Joseph's story. But one of the things I need you to look at and to understand, because it's all well and good for us to look at how the Bible portrays the people who saw Jesus Christ, the people who got a real picture of him. But you need to have learned to have the right picture of who Jesus is in your own heart and your own mind, which means you need to get to know him. You need to spend time with him. You don't get to know people if you don't spend time with them. I can run around and say, oh, I know so-and-so and I know so-and-so, but if I never talk to them and I never see them, I don't really know them. I know nothing about them other than maybe their name. If you're going to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you've got to spend time with him. You've got to learn to know him like Mary knew him. You've got to learn to know him like the prophets knew him. You've got to learn to know him like his Joseph knew him. And you've got to learn to know him like his disciples ended up knowing him when he walked this earth. Jesus is no longer that baby in that crib. He didn't stay there. He is no longer the God who died on the cross for us. He rose from the grave. He is the, the king who's coming again. One day, you will either learn to face him, you will either learn to deal with him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, or you will face him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And I'd much rather be his child than wait for him to come back and judge me because I rejected him. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you much rather be related to the king that's standing on the outside and looking in when he comes back. I want to be, I'm so glad to be a child of the King. To have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And to know that he loves me and he cares for me and he desires to have that relationship with me. He's not Christ in the crib. He's not Christ in the cross. He is Christ who is coming again. And one day he will come back. One day he will return. And when he does, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. I want to confess it now. I don't want to wait until he decides to return. Because I want to be in relationship with him because he paid such a horrible price for my sin. He died for me as he died for you. See, Christ at Christmas, the Jesus that we need to learn to see, is the King. He is the boss. He is the Lord. He's our precious treasure. He bears our burdens. Nothing happens outside of his hand. He desires to be in that relationship with you. Tonight, as we close in prayer, I really want you to consider how do I see Jesus? Do I see him as that cute little baby in the crib? He doesn't pose a threat to anybody there. In fact, he's vulnerable. He giggles and coos a little bit. But he's not a threat. He's not going to beat anybody up. He's not going to make you change things. Or are you going to see him as the Lord he truly is? As Jesus is Lord. Which means he's going to demand changes out of your life. 
because you can't stay where you are and serve him. Father, we bow in your presence. I know you love us. I know that your, that your son died for us on a cross 2,000 years ago. He was that baby in the crib at one point. You did send him to earth to take on a human form. He didn't have to do that. He could have said no way and just never done it. But he loved us so much that he was willing to take on that burden, to take on the pain and sorrow of being a human so that he could die in our place. He's the only person who ever lived a sinless life, Lord. We know that. And he's the only one who could have paid that price for us. Thank you that you do love us that much. That you made a way to redeem us. To restore us to the relationship that you created us for. To put us back on track. To be in relationship with you. Because that's where you were all the time. Just trying to get us to come back to you. I pray, Lord, for those who hear my voice tonight, that they might come to know you as Savior and Lord if they don't know you already. I plead with you, God. Your word says that you're not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. You want everyone to know you because you love them. You don't want to send anybody to hell. It's not what you created it for. People make that decision and that choice to go there, not you. You made a way out. And you've got the lifeline for them. They've just got to learn to accept the gift. Father, for those who hear my voice tonight and they don't know you, I pray that you would work on their hearts and their minds to help them see that you are alive, that we really do serve a living Savior, that you really do love them, that you really do care about them. Help them to feel your touch. Help them to feel your hands. Help them to know your heart. Show them that you love them. Show them how much you love them. Father, I pray for those of us here tonight who hear me, who are your believers. They're, you're saved. They know you. They have that relationship. I pray, Lord, that you would help us develop a deeper relationship with you. Father, that we would not be content to stay where we are and to stagnate, but that we learn to focus on the true Jesus of Christmas. Not the little cute baby in the manger. Not to focus on the jolly fat guy. Not to focus on the reindeer or the shopping. But to realize that we celebrate the birth and the gift of your son for our sin. Thank you for hearing our prayer, Lord. In your Son's most precious name, amen. I hope that this week, as you go about your daily activities, that you will stop and think, who is Jesus? What does he mean to me? How am I supposed to view him? What does the Bible really have to say about him? I encourage you that if you're going to be here Saturday night, that you go into the book of Luke and you read about Joseph and ponder what it has to say. Yes, I'm giving you homework. That you take some time to think about how Jesus and Joseph related and how Joseph dealt with the announcement. Because that's what we're going to be talking about on Saturday. See how Joseph saw Jesus. I pray that this week you learn to plug into that power source. That you learn to develop that relationship with him. And to grow closer and more intimately involved with him. He loves you so, so much. And desires so much for you to get closer and to develop and to grow. Don't be content to stay where you are. He doesn't want that. He wants you to grow closer to him. That's why he loves you. He wants to grow closer in that relationship because he loves you. And he wants you to understand and love him. I plead with you tonight that you consider all that we've talked about 
that you consider what Mary saw in her son, Jesus Christ, and learn to imitate him and focus on his revelation of what God is really like to a world that desperately needs him. Thank you for hearing me tonight. I pray that God will give you something that you can apply to your life from what I was said, from what the Word has to say to us. Thank you for coming. Thank you for hearing me. I want to remind you that on Monday night we have a fellowship and we're going to be doing something a little different this week. Um, we're actually going to be showing a movie. You'll see the, the advertisements come out. We're going to actually watch a movie as part of our Monday night fellowship. We have services on Saturday nights at 5, as well as Sunday morning at 5 and Sunday night at 5. Yay! I finally remembered to say it all in SLT, Second Lifetime. I keep trying to transfer it, convert it into Eastern Standard Time, but I, I managed to do it that time. Um, we have a morning devotional at 3.15 a.m., out there in those purplish, bluish, I don't know what color that actually is, Brian, chairs out there. Um, that's our fun chair ride, by the way. They multiply when you sit in them. You sit in and it creates a new chair. And it's a lot of fun to all sit in them and watch it spin you around. <laughs> Brian doesn't know what color it is either. That's good. Well, whatever color they are, those are the chairs that, you know, that we sit in and have devotional every morning. And we, Brian usually leads it. We, we read from... Um, Sorry, Brian, I just went blank. <laughs> Daily bread. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm sorry. I'm getting old. What can I say? Um, but we, we do have fellowship as well. Um, every night we're not having service. We usually have a fellowship. Brian has a Bible study on Friday nights, and we've been working through the book of John. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be there this week. Uh, my real life is going to interfere. But um, we, we do have a Bible study on Friday nights upstairs in the... Uh, classroom, the little teleporter thing out. Yes, we never run out of chairs. They just grow. We get more chairs. They divide and multiply. It's sort of like, you know, Jesus had the miracle of the five loaves and the two fishes and he fed 5,000. Well, we've got the two chairs and we can seat 20. Anyway, I do thank you for coming. You guys are dismissed. I'm going to go turn off voice now. If you have gotten saved tonight, and you want to share it, please, I would love to know about it. If you don't feel like you trust, you don't feel like you can share it with me, please take the time, share it with Pastor Brian, or you can share it with Negley over there, who's more than will, willing to help you and listen. Um, if you just don't feel comfortable letting us know in Second Life, I pray that you will find a church in your area where you can share your newfound faith and learn to grow together. Church isn't really about doing it alone. It's not the Lone Ranger. And even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. Christianity is about developing and growing as a family and as a body. And you can't do that by yourself. You need other body parts to function. And that's what a church is. Church is not perfect people. It never has been. It never will be. It is imperfect people learning to grow together. And all of them have to grow. Nobody's gotten there. Nobody really has all the answers other than Jesus Christ. But that's part of growing. It's part of developing. And it helps to have other believers who are going through some of the same struggles and some of the same hardships to love on you and to encourage you when you're, when you're struggling as well. And you to be there to help them when they struggle. Thank you, guys. You're dismissed. I'll be out in the foyer if you need to talk. Um, I'm going to go ahead and shut off voice now so you can, don't have to listen to me any longer. And, um, again, have a great week. We will talk to you later.